Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Uh, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there who might not have kids physically, but have definitely been mothers spiritually to people over the years. Um, so the scripture reading this morning comes from Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 31. We're not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read the first couple of verses. And it says there, tell me, you who want to be under the law, don't you hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave and the other by a free woman. But the one by the slave was born as a result of the flesh, while the one by the free woman was born through promise. That's Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 through 23. One of the uh, funnier stories uh, that I look back on as a child uh, has to do with uh, three things, or well, four things. Uh, my dad, now and laters, the candy, my brother, and Walmart. Uh, when we were younger, my dad, we were asking dad, hey, um, is there any way that we could have some, some candy, you know, today? And dad said, well, if you're good this week, we'll go to Walmart and we'll, we'll get some candy. And so one day, uh, mom was busy and we were with dad and dad said, hey, come with me to Walmart. Uh, we're going we're gonna to go and I've got to pick some stuff up. We used to live back in a forest. We chopped all the trees down. So we were going and, and getting stuff for, for the yard. My dad is an avid fan of mowing grass. Uh, and so as we were in the checkout line, everything seemed fine. We got home. Um, and then as Dustin and I were in the back in our room, all of a sudden we heard, Dean, Dustin, get out here now. Now, I don't know about you, but that's never something you want to hear as a conversation starter from your father, right? And so we came into the, the kitchen and dad pointed over at the island and said, whose are those? Now, guess what they were? Now and laters, the candy, I don't even know if they make those anymore. And um, so I'm sitting there looking at Dustin like, you better say something. Because I am not taking the fall for you or with you. That's kind of the look. You, you guys who have siblings know what I'm talking about. And he's just looking at me like, mm-mm. Mm-mm. Not today. He's willing to drag me into it. And so uh, when it's, I don't know how it works with brothers and sisters who are, are different ages, but with twins, it's whoever says not me first wins. So when he kind of gave me that look, I said, they're not mine. And my father looked at my brother and he said, is that true? And I'm over there like, I'm good. Unless he says they're deans, right? Because then you get into the quagmire of, well, I don't know who to believe. I'm going to beat both of them, right? So finally, thankfully, see, I was the good kid. I'm just letting you know. Uh, Eileen's like, you lying right now. <laughs> uh, and so he finally fessed up and said, yeah, they're mine. And dad looked at him and said, why in the world did you take the now and laters? I'm, I promised you that if you were just good this week, that you would eventually, we would go back to Walmart and we would have this, you would have candy, both of you good. And he asked him, did you pay for it? No. So you stole the candy from Walmart. And he said, out of all the places to steal from, one, why Walmart? And all the things to steal from Walmart, why candy? Dustin didn't really have an answer. And you kind of can probably guess how the story ended up. Actually, he didn't whip him. He took him back to Walmart to the exact register that he stole the candy from. 
And this, uh, and I'm not going to exaggerate it. There's only like one or two that were missing. And he went and he took the candy to the lady and said, ma'am, this does not belong to me. I took this from you. And my father ended up paying, I don't even know what it was, like 87 cents plus tax or something like that to the lady to pay for the candy. See, the issue was, is that my father had made a promise. And for whatever reason, my brother maybe thought that he could expedite the promise of my father by serving himself because he already knew that one, he was his son, and two, hey, the promise might have seen, you know, for, for a six or seven year old, a week is a long time. A week can feel like eternity. And so in that moment, he said, you know what? I think that I'll serve the flesh to expedite or exceed the promise that the father has already said he would give. You know, some of us, maybe even all of us at some point as a child, have heard a promise from a father or a mother. And because in that moment we were weak, we decided that we were going to do something kind of to serve ourselves and kind of in and of ourselves fulfill the promise of our parents. And just like this story that I shared with you this morning, oftentimes, maybe even all the times, it never goes according to plan, does it? Because once we've done it, maybe we've gotten away, away with it, but we still feel the guilt and the shame of saying, you know what? I did that even though my parents promised me I could have that very same thing. Or mom and dad find out. Because here's the thing about serving yourself in trying to get something that your parents have already promised you. Is that once you tell the lie, you've got to cover your tracks. And unless you're a really, 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 really good liar, at some point, as a young person, you'll slip up. But that's not uncommon to what we see in the Bible. Character after character, person after person. And this morning we're going to talk about a specific family and a specific group of people that even despite what the Father had promised them, tried to serve themselves and thought that their relationship with the Father wouldn't change. And in Galatians chapter 4, we see this analogy that Paul is using as he's appealing to Christians in Galatia. And the theme of this book is that they are under attack. They are being bombarded with false gospel. And Paul, even in the beginning in chapter one, says that there's only one gospel, that even if an angel from heaven taught a false gospel, that that angel uh, himself would be condemned. And so he walks through uh, Jewish history as well. And he lets them know that uh, you're justified by faith, not by works. And so as we come to chapter four in the book of Galatians, he notes that there was this law that the people there wanted everybody else to hold on to, even though that there was a promise that came before the law, that came to Abraham, as God promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations, and through him, all nations would be blessed. And that was fulfilled, as we see throughout the text of Scripture, in Jesus Christ. Yet here, in this letter, there are people who are influencing the church, saying that it's not on the basis of faith by which you are saved. It's on the basis of having Jesus Christ in your life plus this operation of the flesh, this abiding of this physical operation known as circumcision. And even to a greater extent, you have to obey the law. And so right in the middle of Galatians chapter four, Paul brings up what I like to call in, the in this whole book, his trump card. In the story, not just of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, but also of their own nation's history. And what Paul is going to say, and what Paul has said previously is this, you can't be slaves to the flesh and keep your relationship 
the same with the Father. And so in Galatians chapter 4, 2 and 1, he says there, tell me, you who want to be under the law, which is one, a, a preposterous thing on the surface. Why would anybody who's been set free from a master want to run back to the master that enslaved them in the first place? And he says, you who desire to be under this law, you who desire to bind circumcision on all of these people, have you not read the law? Have you not heard the law? And what a great reminder to them of what the law actually did. The law exposed to the Jewish people that they could not keep the law perfectly. It wasn't that, uh, that, God, that the law in and of itself was unholy or unrighteous or, or wasn't something that was divine or perfect. It was that the people of Israel couldn't keep it perfectly. It's that the people of Israel, the problem wasn't with the law, the problem was with the people. And so he says, for it was written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave and the other by a free woman. But one by the slave was born as a result of the flesh. The other one, while the other was, was by a free woman, was born through the promise. And so this is what Paul is going to do. He is going to set up Sarah and Hagar as an as a illustration as a, a, a comparison and a contrast between the law of Moses and the freedom that's found in the promise that was given to Abraham. And he's going to show how one is inferior to the other. How the law that's under, that is used as Sarah, the promise that's used as Sarah, equals freedom. But that which took place under Hagar is actually slavery. Verse 24, these things are being taken figuratively for the woman represents two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai and bears children into slavery. This is Hagar. Now Hagar represents Mount Sinai in Arabia corresponding to the present Jerusalem for she is in slavery with her children. And so what Paul is doing is he's identifying those false teachers as the people who are under the covenant of Hagar, the people who are, quote, the current or the Jerusalem, the Jewish factions that are in Galatia that are seeking to bind the law on people. And he says that those people are the ones who have enslaved themselves because of the flesh. But the Jerusalem above, which would be Sarah, is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, rejoice, ch uh, childless woman, unable to give birth, burst into song and shout, you who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate woman will be many, more numerous than those of the women who had a husband. And so the question is, all right, well, he set up this comparison and contrast. He's seeking to show that, that the people of the flesh are of Hagar and the people of the promise are of Sarah. But why would he quote Isaiah 54, 1 right here? Because he's recalling them, their history. He's recalling them what resulted when people tried to keep the law perfectly. And what happened? The people of Israel knew that they struggled to keep the law perfectly. And in the process of trying to keep the law perfectly, and in the process of trying to be perfect, their gaze was cast towards other gods. Maybe gods that didn't have the same standard as Yahweh. Gods that would allow them to do some things that Yahweh wouldn't allow them to do. And so that the uh, obedience to these other gods in the ancient Near East seemed to be easier as far as emotionally, seemed to be more desirable physically from a fleshly standpoint. And so they turned to graven images and sought out graven images as the source of their own personal uh, satisfaction and salvation. And Isaiah 54, 1 recalls to the people in the book of Galatians what took place. Isaiah 54, the book of Isaiah, is a book written during a time of 
slavery, a time of captivity, a time in which the people of Israel knew that the reason that they were under the thumb of the Babylonians is because they didn't obey God, they didn't respect his law, and they sought other things to satisfy themselves. They were people of the flesh. And because of that, they found themselves in a situation of not just exile, but also death. And so Paul's using this also in a very spiritual sense that those who would, who would find favor in seeking after the fleshly desires to satisfy their own personal wants and needs and lust will ultimately find themselves in a position of exile and death. The false teachers who are here who are saying that you have to undergo this fleshly operation in order to be a Christian, well, the, the, that road leads to exile and death because you can't serve the flesh and maintain a relationship with the Father. Because don't we remember the story of Sarah, Hagar, and Abraham? What happens there? In the book of Genesis, God comes to Abraham and says, you're going to be the father of many nations through your seed. Every nation will be blessed. But there was one problem. How in the world was Abraham going to be the father of many nations when Sarah was barren? The answer is God. But what does Sarah do? See, they've been given the promise of the father but they decide to serve the flesh. And so Sarah gives her servant Hagar over to Abraham and they birth Ishmael. And from that point forward, there is a whole lot of fracturing in the relationship of that family. All because they tried to expedite the promise of God. They took it upon themselves. They believed that they could fulfill the promise, not the way that God wanted them to fulfill the promise, but the way that they thought it was best. And isn't it interesting that as people of God today, that oftentimes we find ourselves in trouble, oftentimes we find ourselves struggling spiritually, struggling relationally, struggling even emotionally, because too often what takes place is when God says, I promise you that there's this place, or I promise you that there's this thing, or I promise you that you are peculiar people or God says I promise I promise I promise all you have to do is have faith and follow and so many people find themselves as an island unto themselves in a vortex of pain and suffering because they tried feed themselves God's promise through fleshly means. I wonder what would happen if the people in the world, not just people in the church, but the people in the world stopped comparing themselves by themselves. Because here's the trap that we set for ourselves. The same trap that the people in, the false teachers in Galatia set for themselves. We have a series of issues that we have to face, that we have to come to grips with, that oftentimes we believe that the goal of this thing called Christianity is simply making sure that we're following the list of don'ts. As long as I don't A, as long as I don't B, as long as I don't C, as long as I don't D, as long as I don't E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. As long as I'm making myself morally better 
than the rest of the world, that automatically equals that I have a viable relationship with God. As long as I move myself through the process of church, the process of Christianity, then I'm all right. But isn't that kind of the mindset of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Weren't they the ones who were strictly about laying on themselves the standard that neither they nor their fathers could bear? And this is what I mean by that. See, if all Christianity is is simply a system to make you morally better than the next person next to you. Then how is that really different than simply reading a self-help book? Because here's the thing. I can become a morally better person and still not have a viable relationship with God. For instance, even people who are skeptical about the nature or existence of God on the surface can be just as moral as me. And so Christianity isn't just about becoming a morally better person. Christianity is about following and having, maintaining and allowing the presence of God and a relationship of God to overwhelm you, not just so you become a morally better person, so that you look completely and totally different than the rest of the world. Those are two totally different things. But if the way in which I get to that is simply through trying to be a better me without consulting the word of God, without following the word of God, by laying a standard on me that God has not placed on me, I will find myself always failing because I've really turned myself in to God. And so Paul goes on to state in the very next verse. Now you two brothers and sisters like Isaac are the children of the promise. But just as the children born as a result of the flesh persecuted the one born as a result of the spirit, so also now. And so Paul says, this is what you can expect if you're a child of the promise. You can expect that these people will seek to influence you and move you towards the ways of the world. They'll move you towards the ways of their worldview. They'll move you towards the ways of their operating systems and their religious systems and all the things that they like to bind on people. That's, what's take, that's what took place then and that's what's taking place now. And so here's the other aspect that I want to bring up to you this morning is that if we're going to be children of the promise, not only can we not enslave ourselves to the desires of our flesh or seek to try and, and be just simply better moral people than the next guy and not have a relationship with God, we also have to detach ourselves from some of the traditions that we hold. Now, let me make myself clear. There are absolutely positively things within the words of this book that tell us what we're supposed to do, who we're supposed to be, and what worship with one another is supposed to look like. I'm not saying that we should go to over and atop of the, over atop of those. But sometimes we find ourselves in the rut of maintaining and holding on to traditions that if we would simply let them go, not only would we be freer spiritually, but we'd also have a better capacity to reach the outside world. What do I mean by that? This is what I mean. Sometimes we get in the habit of saying that just because a denomination does something, it's automatically wrong. Remember when Jesus was with the disciples 
And they're out and they're picking grain. And what happens? The Pharisees come to Jesus and ask why their disciples are picking grain. And there are other situations where they're asking Jesus, you know, why are your disciples working? Or why are your disciples doing this? Or why are your disciples doing that? And Jesus says, well, if somebody's ox fell over in the ditch on the Sabbath, would you help them? The answer is obviously yes. So let's say, for instance, there's a denominational group that on every Sunday they give away in their offering one extra dollar. Everybody gives one extra dollar. And they use that. To go out and help somebody in the community or help somebody within their own walls. That's a little weird. I've never heard of that. Or what if there's a denominational group that simply says, you know what? We see empirically that more people are growing because of something like small groups on Sunday night. And therefore, we're going to forego Sunday night. We'll have a group meet at the building, but we'll forego, forego Sunday night so that people can grow spiritually and we have a better capacity to reach the outside world. If we're not careful, we can say that they're wrong simply because they're a denomination. But have we checked the verses of Scripture to see whether or not that's wrong. Or are we like the group here in Galatia that is so tied to circumcision that to not do circumcision means to condemn their very own brothers and sisters? Or what if there's a group that says, you know what, instead of, you know, there's a majority of people here in this congregation who really don't like their giving to be seen in public. Maybe what we'll do is we'll set some baskets in the back and people can give as they leave. Now that's a little weird. That's something that a lot of us haven't seen. That's something that a lot of us haven't done. But the question is, are we saying they're wrong because they violated scripture? Or are we saying they're wrong because that's not our tradition? See, the Pharisees were wrong, one, because they bound something that God had never legislated. And two, they held on to their tradition in light of what Jesus said. And so the difference between the child of the promise and the child of the slave is that the child of the slave always and consistently appeals to their opinion, appeals to their flesh, appeals to the system regardless of its impact and regardless of its weight on the people around them. Whereas the child of the promise takes heart that the promise is there and lives by according to the promise. Does not seek to go over top of the Father, but also notes that where there is freedom in the promise, that that freedom is not only allowable, but that freedom is also encouraged. And so this morning, the question that we have to ask ourselves when it comes to this passage, note what Paul says following. He says there in verse 30, but what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave and her son for the son of the slave will never be a co-heir with the son of the free woman. Therefore, brothers, as, this, as brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave, but children of the free woman. For freedom, Christ set us free. Stand firm and do not submit to the yoke of slavery. See, when Jesus came on this earth, he said a lot of things that a lot of people didn't agree with. He rubbed a lot of people or the wrong way. But he taught with passion. He taught with authority. He taught with divine inspiration, not because he got it from God, but because he was God. 
And we have to evaluate individually and collectively whether or not why we do what we do makes us the product of the slave or the product of the promise. And individually, another question that needs to be asked this morning, what are you a slave to that's keeping you away from a greater relationship with God and a greater relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ? It might be some form of addiction. It might be some personal issue as far as attitude. And it might even be a tradition. So this morning, who are we going to be? And what are we going to do to know for certain that we are children of the promise? not the children of the slave. Because the slave serves the flesh. And if you serve the flesh, you can't maintain the same relationship with the Father. Let's think about that this morning as we stand and as we sing.